Welcome, everyone. Great to be with you again. Here we go. Another great movie to help us wake up <laughs> from the dream. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the song from this movie, uh, quite famous, called Let It Go. And it it really is inspiring in the sense that it it is always a, a reminder whenever I hear that song to let the past go. And the, another line in that song is, the past is in the past. And, and Jesus tells us that in The Course in Miracles. He says, the past is gone. It can touch me not. Uh, it's telling us that the, the, or the Course is saying the future is imagined, the, the past is over and gone. And what does it mean to let go of the past? Or well, maybe we could take a moment as we go into this great movie, Frozen, and talk a little bit about what it means to let go of the past. To let go of the past is not to let go of specific images or specific memories. It's to let go of the belief system that projected the whole cosmos and all of the memories the positive memories and the negative memories are all part of the past. So we have been accustomed to try to release the negative, and we have associated the negative with the past. But what Jesus is teaching us is that judgment is on a continuum. Uh, the ego is a belief in separation from God. It projects out a cosmos that's very linear and it divides that cosmos into a, a past cosmos, a present one, and a future, although that present one is still not the real present moment. It's not the light. It's not the holy instant. It's just another construct. So when we say, be present with the tree, or be present with the butterfly, that's just meant to bring you your attention to relax and sink deep inward to go toward the light, because the light is the present moment. Uh, the perceptual world is, is all past, over and gone. The script is written. So when we look at it in terms of this movie, we're going to see that in this movie, our two, I would say our two main characters are two sisters, Elsa and Anna. And Elsa and Anna, have, uh, in many ways, a pretty typical sibling relationship. Uh, uh, one is older than the other. Uh, Elsa is older than Anna, and uh, Elsa seems to have some, um, some powers. Uh, she can seem to do things uh, almost like a little wizard. She has these powers, and it's interesting with the idea of power in this world, because we can believe that we we have powers in terms of physical strength or mental strength or powers of intelligence. Some may feel they have psychic powers. Uh, we may believe in things like political power. Uh, we can believe in uh, personal power, like the power of influence and the power of persuasion. And then you get into things like manifesting, where you can believe that you, you have a personal mind that's capable of manifesting things, manifesting diamonds and rubies, soulmates, houses, cars, <laughs> all kinds of things. So there's the whole manifesting power thing. But we could say that even with manifesting, even with using the power of the mind to try to bring something into manifestation or form, that that's just, that's just a reverberation or a reflection. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a glimmering of what real power is. And then we start to understand as we go much deeper, that all of those powers that I just mentioned, aren't powerful at all. None of them, not a single one of them, because all power is of God, and all power is of spirit. Just like love 
uh, Jesus teaches us in the workbook of the Course that there is only one kind of love, there is only one love, and it's God's love. And and everything else is uh, is an imitation, it's a substitute. And the same with power, that all power is of spirit. So we could say that the Kingdom of Heaven, our, our eternal home, is what, what the power is. And then, the problem with perceiving power in the cosmos, in the projected cosmos of the ego, is that if you believe there's actually power in this world, then you believe in miscreation. <laughs> you believe that you can take the power of God and use it, or I should say misuse it, <laughs> to project, to manifest, to make something be the way that you believe you want it, which is really just the ego's preferences. Uh, that's all it is when, when even in Star Trek, uh, when uh, Jean-Luc Picard, the captain of the Enterprise, uh, tells his first lieutenant, uh, make it so. <laughs> make it so. And the problem is that we can't make anything so in this world, because it's a projection. So, if we believe that there is such a thing as personal power, or power to use the mind to make forms, or to manifest specific forms, or political power, or physical power, or the power of money, power of wealth, the power of influence, uh, all these things, the power of persuasion, all these things, if, if you believe in any of them, then basically, you believe in miscreation. And what miscreation is, is the belief that the separation has happened. And what forgiveness is, is the experience that the separation never happened. So, you can see that the return to the awareness of, of divine power requires starting to realize the impossibility of anything that would be uh, other than that divine power, other than God, other than Christ. And when Jesus seemed to heal the sick and raise the dead, he wasn't really manifesting uh, in the way that we think of manifesting. It was just he was drawing forth a witness that the power of God triumphs or transcends every law of this world the laws of, of economics, the power of God transcends those, the laws of gravity, the, the laws of uh, rules and regulations, and, and uh, the laws of, of countries, the physical laws, the, the laws of physics, all of the laws of the, of the cosmos are generated from the belief in separation, which means that all of the laws of the cosmos are part of the belief in miscreation. The good news is, is that miscreation is impossible. Uh, would God have created a, a being of light that could miscreate? No. <laughs> God doesn't make mistakes. That God doesn't extend all this power and glory and go, ooh, I hope I hope they don't misuse it, <laughs> because God knows the reality of love. The only law there is is the law of love, the law of divine love. So in this movie, we're going to see the two sisters, and Elsa uh, will seem to rise to be the, the queen of the land, and, uh, and her sister Anna, her younger sister, uh, and Elsa, they're going to go through a lot of different um, situations and circumstances that will involve um, rebellion, uh, protectionism, it will involve um, specialness, uh, it will involve um, this idea of um, trying to physically turn away and physically depart or put distance uh, between, in order to gain a sense of freedom. 
And of course, many of us have tried that. We, a lot of times when we're teenagers, we dream of the day when we will leave our parents' house and suddenly everything will be perfect. <laughs> Once we walk out the door of our parents' house, angels will sing, butterflies will come and surround and swirl around our head, our cares and concerns with those authoritative beings will be done once we walk through the door and say goodbye i'm on my own now i'm 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 an adult i'm an adult i'm i'm a free adult and then we only get like three or four steps and we go ah well i don't feel too free why well, i thought i would be super free <laughs> when i walked out of my parents house i thought i'd be super super free and we realize that the freedom is not to be found in the body. Now, many of us will go through many more experiences with the hero of the dream, the body, which will just show us constantly that we are not free. <laughs> Still imprisoned as, as long as we believe the body uh, can bring us freedom. We're really looking for the freedom in the wrong direction. We should be going toward the light to find that freedom, not uh, looking into the physicality to find the freedom. So in this movie, we're going to see a lot of these things played out. And I mentioned that I think these sisters, Elsa and Anna, are really, I think, the main characters. But we we do kind of have a, a Holy Spirit reflection that is uh, that is white, <laughs> white like a dove, and it's Olaf. It's a snowman. Yes, that's right. We have a snowman to come and reflect the all-inclusiveness of love, the relaxation of love, the trust and faith of love, the faith that it's always going to work out no matter what. Uh, and and in many ways, he's, he's very, very loving. He's quite humorous, and he's also quite uh, clueless at times, which... Uh, that's another good uh, characteristic of uh, being a reflection of the Holy Spirit, because you don't put meaning into the situations. You basically realize that to let go of the past is simply to let go of all of the ego meaning that was put on the world. And that's why Jesus has workbook lessons for us. Like, I do not understand what anything is for. In fact, the very first workbook lesson of the Course is nothing I see means anything. And this is Jesus calling us and saying, just be willing to drop everything that you believe and think about this world. Leave the world as a blank space. Uh, why not leave the world as a as a canvas and that let the Holy Spirit give you a perspective? Let the Holy Spirit give the meaning to the images. And he'll give you a very unified, holistic meaning. But don't try to read meaning into anything of this world. Because when you read meaning into any image or any situation or any circumstance, then that just means that you believe that the past is real. And if you believe the past is real, you believe miscreation is real. And if you believe you can misuse the power of God, you'll feel guilty. And it's all because of the belief in the impossible. Uh, and Walt Disney, you know, Walt Disney... You know, the, the the company and Walt himself first started off with animation and Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, and it started off as cartoons. And, and, and here we are, we're still in cartoon land here. And most of us, when we watch a cartoon, there's a part of us that's like knows that it's watching an animation. It's watching animated characters. Uh, they do things to the animated characters. With Anna and Elsa, they give them big, beautiful eyes. So we go, ooh, we fall in love with Anna and Elsa because of their big eyes. Uh, they, they basically 
are taking images and they're moving the images around and giving them meaning as if they have life. And when we look at the the built world or the physical world or even the natural world of, of trees and oceans and rivers, it's the same thing. This this world is very much just like animation. It's it's we're just giving motion and meaning to images and calling it life. We're calling it uh we're calling it life. We're calling it our life. When we say how how did you live your life, we're saying how how did you handle those moving images? <laughs> And Jesus is really working to teach us that that what we perceive is really not life at all. It's just it's just a bunch of interpretations. And we keep reacting emotionally to our mind's interpretations of the images. And so the mind training is to help us learn to give those interpretations over, align with the Holy Spirit, and see the world from a version of the present moment. What do I mean by a version of the present moment? Well, the present moment is pure light. So to see the world, and we'll call it a purified form of the past, a unified form of the past, a holistic form of the past, that's what it means to forgive. To see the world as a dream, and, and the dream is completely unified. So we're going to take a ride today. You're going to love the music. Uh, this is kind of a classic movie that we have in our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. And and I want you to just watch your mind throughout this whole movie as we go through it, because, because there are some important things that are important themes. When we think we can save a brother or a sister, when we can save a sibling, or we need to save a sibling, sibling, we're basically still seeing the salvation in terms of the form. And Jesus is coaxing us to see that salvation is in our mind. We have to see the world completely differently than we've seen it in order to experience salvation, redemption, enlightenment, awakening. We have to see the world with completely new eyes. We have to... Uh, I always remember my friend Judy Scutch, the publisher of the course, she said, we have to see the world through realize. She'd say to me, we have to realize. <laughs> Not these eyes, our real eyes, <laughs> our spiritual eye, our, our let thine eye be single eye that Jesus talked about. So sit back, enjoy the movie, and I will come in for some commentary at certain points. And uh, what a ride. Here we go. We're back to Disney again. It seems like we come back to Disney a lot because we really love to wake up with Disney with these beautiful animations. Okay, here we go. Let's roll it. So this is good. You, you just saw that exchange. They were using words like conceal it. And don't feel it and hide it. Whoa, <laughs> there's there's some definite fear underneath there with conceal it, don't feel it, and hide it. And we could say that when the mind believed that it could separate from God, and which has been called the fall from grace and uh, the separation in many different uh, things, it's been called a detour into fear that basically the power of the mind was, was denied and pushed out of awareness. So nowadays, when you talk to human beings, they talk a lot about personal power or the power to turn their life around or wanting to be empowered as a person through human development and skills and abilities. But all the skills and abilities that human beings seem to possess are really just very faint reflections of the power of the mind. Uh, for most human beings, you know, if you talk to many scientists, they would tell you 
Well, you have a brain, <laughs> but not a mind, because that's how ingenious the ego's trick of time and space is to make up a body with a brain and then associate thinking with brain activity. That's how that's how ingenious the ego is at making up a fake fantasy world and trying to assign meaning. And therefore, when people point to their head and say, I'm thinking about it, uh, they are associating thought with the brain and the head. But but thought is not in a brain. Uh, thought is actually those little neurotransmitters that move through uh, the gray matter in the brain are are also very, very faint little reflections of, of actual thoughts. And when the mind falls asleep, it forgets its power completely because it's pushed away heaven. It's denied heaven, it's denied spirit, it's denied God, and it's basically denied the di divine mind, which is where the power is. It's in the divinity of the mind, the, the capital mind, the mind that is in the mind of God and one with the mind of God. That That is all powerful. So it, we can already see that Elsa seemed to have these powers. She could seem to manifest snow and um, and shape it into a snowman, and she could move, uh, manifest ice and move the ice. And, and Anna was used to hopping and playing in the snow and the ice and the snowmen without even leaving the palace. This is just inside the palace, and, and uh, Elsa is using her powers of manifestation. But in the end, what we start to realize is when we look at our what seem to be our experiences in this world, we can see where we have given belief to certain things, and we've we've attempted to spiritualize matter, and we've attempted to bring that power into matter, and and give it a name. Uh, and so, in this world, there seems to be many, many different types of power. But as I was saying earlier, none of them are actually true power, because all power is of God, and only of God. All power is of light, and all power is pure abstraction. So this world is a complete denial of that. And we can see that uh, the protectionism has already started, because the king and the queen see that Elsa has these magical powers and they need to be controlled. The trolls that they went to for help have basically erased all the memory, and they said that in these powers there, there is beauty and there is danger. And she's told that fear will be her enemy. That's, that's a good description of a split mind that is not sure of what it is. So we could say that judgment is an ability that was made up after the seeming fall from grace. And so all judgment is, is a fearful use of the mind. And that's why Jesus' entire teachings in the Bible could be summarized in judge not. Even if you remember nothing else from the Sermon on the Mount, even if you only remember two words from the Sermon on the Mount, it's judge not, because all judgment is an attempted misuse of the power of the mind. God did not create judgment. There is no judgment in God. Uh, even things in Christianity which talk about the, the last judgment, it's really, uh, that's what the atonement or forgiveness really is, but it's it's not God that's making that judgment. It's 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 really when your mind wakes up and sees the the forgiveness, sees the impossibility of judgment, that that's the last judgment. <laughs> it's not God making any judgments at all. God doesn't even know of judgment. God is pure love and oneness. So as we move through this movie, you'll see that the protectionism of the ego is coming in to protect protect people from being harmed by the magical powers. And, of course, the 
the king and the queen, they're trying to protect their daughter, Anna. And so they've tried to limit or hide or deny uh, Elsa's powers in order to do that. Now, the trolls did say that in the magical powers, um, that there was also beauty in the magical powers. That's the miracle. That's why we study A Course in Miracles. We're looking for the beauty <laughs> in the power of the mind. So when you call on Jesus and say, I'm ready to be a miracle worker, you're basically saying, I'm giving my mind over you, to you, Jesus, to perform miracles through it. Not that you personally are performing the miracles. <laughs> you're just giving your mind over to let the miracles come through. And that is the most reflective use. Uh, I'll say it's 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 productive. It's it's helpful. It's healing. Uh, it's actually just wonderful. Uh, the the beautiful aspect of magical powers is not uh, trying to manipulate the images and trying to use it in a manifesting way, but actually allowing Jesus to come through with the miracle so that you can see like a little glimpse or a little snapshot of the falsity. When you're in the miracle, you're calm, you're, you're, you're quiet, your mind is quiet because it, it sees that it can't really change the world. It's just looking upon the past and seeing it as past. Seeing the false as false is, is what the miracle does. Uh, it, it, as Jesus says in the Course, the miracle looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. So that's the beautiful use of the of the mind's power. What that's bringing the mind back into alignment with God through the Holy Spirit's uh, guidance, and and it's also beautiful in the sense that that it it takes your mind into peace and and it returns the mind to peace that's really what the the purpose of the miracle is so we're called to be devoting our days all of our days and devoting our 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 focus and our attention and our through our willingness to miracles in order to see the world differently and then as we see the world differently we're ready to wake up from it, literally, to remember God and remember creation. So we're at the beginning here, and you're starting to see pretty strong protectionism coming in. And um, even though the trolls said, we're going to take out all the memories of the healing powers, the troll said, we're going to leave the fun, <laughs> take away all the memories of the of the powers, magical powers, and leave the fun. But actually, if you look at Anna's face and Elsa's face, they don't really look too happy. It's it's not easy to to keep the fun in a child <laughs> when something seems to be taken away. Did you ever try to take a spoon away from a baby? who's playing with the spoon. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun at all. It's a, it's a screaming, <laughs> shouting, shouting, give me back my spoon. So this is why it takes a lot of willingness to, to really let the, the miracles come through us consistently before we start to feel the joy and the fun. Okay, here we go. That's That sets us up for the movie here. Okay, so here we see the, the coronation day has arrived, and you can see each sister acting out an aspect of the sleeping mind. For Elsa, she's been for years hiding, concealing this reflection of power that she has, um, out of fear, out of fear of harming someone, it, her father got her some gloves. Um, 
She's very concerned that she's going to make it through the day one day because she's really not had interactions with people, not even with her sister. And so Elsa's kind of reflecting that aspect of the sleeping mind, which is like, wow, I'm really powerful at my core, but I better play small. I better dim this down because I could do some damage with my mind. <laughs> you see? So she's reflecting the belief that there's some power there in the mind and that it could be misused. And that's exactly what the whole cosmos is. It's, it's the attempt to misuse the creative power of the mind in terms of miscreation. So we could say the Big Bang, the entire cosmos, not, not just some specific harm coming to a body, but we could say the general context of the cosmos is it's like a veil drawn over the truth of Christ, of truth of God, God's love. And Elsa is reflecting, okay, I've got to really be careful now and I've got to try to keep the power under control. And then her sister Anna, who she looks like she really let her hair go. <laughs> She's been sleeping a lot. She looks like a, a teenager who's uh, just trying to make it through day by day. <laughs> and then the coronation day comes. She throws the dress on and she goes out like a firecracker but she's like a firecracker of desire. She wants something from the world. She wouldn't mind if she meets the one. <laughs> she was even, it even slipped out of her mouth, you know, when she was talking to him. She said, you're adorable. What, what, what did I just say? <laughs> you're adorable to, to this handsome uh, uh, prince that she's met, kind of, uh, a horse and the prince ran into her. But you can see that's another aspect of the mind. Now that aspect of the mind is, is not in touch with the power of the mind. It's forgotten the power of the mind and it's looking for some satisfaction. It's looking like, yeah, that's right, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction, but I tried. And I tried, you know, she's ready to get out there and get into some action and finally have something happen in her perceived boring, dull, sheltered, closed life. She wants to get to some pizzazz. She wants to get to some sparkle. She's looking for some excitement and she's ready to go out. And those are both aspects of the sleeping mind, looking for excitement in the world is uh, Anna and Elsa trying to make it through the day without destroying something <laughs> with her powerful mind, her magical powers. And those are aspects that you have to face in spiritual awakening. You know, with pursuing excitement and pizzazz in the world, I think many of us have tried that, actually. We've tried it. Actually, some of us really tried it quite a bit. But we were we were met with some sense of disillusionment we were not able to find the lasting excitement in the world <laughs> we we tried too we tried uh we tried a lot of different ways to find that uh consistent excitement and um that would overcome the boredom and the dullness and the guilt but uh we can see from from Elsa, she, her her main thing is she feels uh, she feels trapped. She feels like she's had to try to rein in or cover over or hide something that's actually a part of her. And even though she has not yet found a way to control the magical powers, she does face the fear of the misuse and the and some of the magical powers be bringing harm. And that, of course, 
is a result of the belief in miscreation. The belief that you can misuse God-given power is, is the source of a lot of fear, anxiety, and guilt. The guilt coming when you believe you've actually harmed somebody using the power of your mind. So Jesus is teaching us, he says basically that you are afraid of your thoughts. And that's why it's going to take mind training to bring those thoughts that seem to be body thoughts, we'll call them, bring those body thoughts under Christ's control, to give all those body thoughts, which are all miscreative thoughts, under Christ's control, under the Holy Spirit's direction, or Jesus's direction is going to bring the happiness. Because the Holy Spirit and Jesus can use those thoughts as part of miraculous thinking. Uh, but what you have to do, when you get into the miracle, let's say you surrender to Jesus and you say, use me, use my mind, use it, use it for the healing of the whole, whole. use it for the healing of the whole sonship then what you do is you give these thoughts that there's been so much fear around, you give them over to Jesus and you say, you use them. And once you practice giving your thoughts over to Jesus, you start to find peace of mind come into your mind because when you think that you personally have these thoughts and that these thoughts can be harmful, there's going to be guilt. But when you bring them under the direction of Jesus, you find the guilt disappears. And that's a miracle. And then you just, what does it turn into when you give these thoughts over to Jesus? It turns into guidance. Call so-and-so. See that person over there? Give him a hug. <laughs> uh, be kind. Let let Jesus will actually use the body as a puppet and we'll start speaking through it, if and smiling through it, and hugging through it. If you allow those body thoughts to be under Christ's control, you're going to have a lot of fun, because you're going to see miracles. You're going to see the very helpful use of those thoughts. But if you try to claim those body thoughts as your own, <laughs> that's what we call judgment. <laughs> and it's it's uh it's harsh uh no one feels good who judges because it's not natural it's not a natural condition of the mind so let's watch this now uh wow talk about manifesting it looks like five minutes ago uh that anna was in the castle running around uh, hoping to meet Prince Charming, and uh, she wasn't out. She wasn't out of the castle, the palace, only maybe three minutes, and uh, Prince Charming shows up with a horse. Uh, a, a, a prince shows right up to her, and you can see when you're excited, when you're looking for excitement, uh, that excitement seems to come to you, but it's not exactly a lasting excitement. It's a uh, it's part of a trick, actually, <laughs> that will turn from special love into special hatred. And that's not pretty <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> when, when it flips from special love to special hate, it's like, whoa, what is this? Where did this come from? <laughs> so here we go. Let's go back to the story. So, yeah, you can see uh, that this power of the mind, even as it seems to be magical, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Uh, there's a part in the manual for teachers of a, of a Course in Miracles where Jesus is asked, are psychic powers desirable? And basically, what Jesus tells us is that with this world, with a split mind, and with a, a mind that's split between uh, the right mind, the wrong mind, the Holy Spirit and the ego, then he's not answering whether the psychic powers are actually desirable. He said it's the use to which 
the powers are put is what's important. You see, it's always a choice of purpose. And the ego is the belief in miscreation and misuse of power, because it generated a whole world, a whole cosmos, based on misuse of uh, power to hide from God, to hide from love. And, and yet, as we open our minds to be miracle workers, what we're really praying for is, is like a a creative use or, or a use of the power of the mind in alignment with God, in alignment with the Holy Spirit. So you might say that nothing in the world is good or bad. Even abilities in the mind aren't inherently good or bad. It's just what use are they put? Are they used to help your mind heal and wake up and return and remember God? Or are the powers misused by the ego to perpetuate guilt? And you can see with this scene that we're seeing here in Frozen, um, Elsa's been really kind of hiding and trying to keep things uh, under control, wearing the gloves ever since she was a little girl, um, avoiding contact, leaving the, the gates of the, of the city closed. And now here on the coronation day, things are coming out. Uh, that's pretty quick. Uh, Anna's moving very quick to get married. And uh, that was scary uh, to Elsa because that's she's been trying to keep the power under wraps. And now <laughs> Anna's saying, I, I want to get married. I want your blessing. And I want... Uh, Hans, he he has twelve brothers. I want them all to live in the, in the in the palace. And it's like yipes, you know. Everything that she's tried to do to keep her power under under wraps is uh, it's a threat. So you might say that that this movie is really good for starting to to see that when you pray, you really are praying for alignment with the Holy Spirit's purpose because that is going to make all the difference. If you use your body, your house, your relationships, uh, your, your job, whatever your job or your career, or whatever you seem to have in this world, if you basically gather it all up and you give it over back to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and say, okay, it's yours now. <laughs> I tried it on my own, and it gave me mixed results. <laughs> it did not give me consistent results. But I'm going to give it back. I give these abilities back to you. Uh, maybe you're, you can sing. You give your singing ability to the Holy Spirit. Maybe you can write. Maybe you can drive a car, and you give that ability to the Holy Spirit. Whatever it seems to be. Um, you give it over to the Holy Spirit, and the purpose is, is to let all those skills and ability be channelized and channelized, almost like in a funnel, toward the light. It's like channelizing all skills and abilities that the ego made and channelizing them in one direction, which is the Holy Spirit's use. And then things start to get easier and easier and easier because the tension in the mind starts to leave. The guilt starts to dissipate. The fear starts to subside as all those skills and abilities that the ego made are channelized back toward the light. Then the mind starts to be aware that it's becoming unified and you start to experience yourself as more than human, more than a person, and you start to feel more truly empowered. And how can you know that you're empowered except when you feel peaceful? Now, that's the clear sign <laughs> of empowerment. It's not a sense of triumph. It's not a sense of, of overcoming something in the world in a personal way. It's not a sense of, of personal victory. There is no personal victory in, in merging with the light. It's actually a dissolving away of the identification with the body and the world and, and time and the past and the future. 
So here we go. It, this is now turning into uh, more than just a coronation party. It seems to be being interpreted uh, by pretty much everyone at the party, from uh, sorcery to uh, uh, some kind of um, destruction, destructive ability, or something that seems dangerous. And this is is really what the sleeping mind is afraid of. It's it's afraid of getting in touch with the power of the mind because of the belief in misuse. And, and so Jesus has to say, well, why don't you put it under my control? I'll use the world for miracles. In fact, he says, even when you ask, which miracle should I perform, Jesus? And Jesus tells you, even then, you still have to put the action component of the miracle under Christ's control. So you basically have to let Jesus orchestrate time and space, and you have to let him be in charge of the behavioral, the action component of the miracle. You join in the joy. You join in your mind in the alignment. You're joined in asking Jesus, okay, how can I be of service to the whole? And then Jesus says, and by the way, let me control the action component of the miracle. That's how much surrender it takes. If you think you're going to decide upon the actions, then you can you can go astray pretty quickly. <laughs> because our mind is not purified to the extent of, of Jesus. Jesus can perform miracles indiscriminately, and he knows exactly what to do with the form. He knows if there's a word to be spoken or words, he knows exactly the words. If there's an action that's to happen, he knows exactly the action. But you have to be so surrendered over, just willing to be used for miracles, and then also let Jesus control the action component. Let Jesus control the behavioral component of the miracle. If there's some behavioral component involved, it cannot be under your own voluntary control. That's why Jesus says miracles are involuntary and they should not be under conscious control. So it's almost like saying, if you use the puppet or the marionette analogy, you really have to give over the strings <laughs> to the puppeteer. And the puppeteer is, is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then things flow so easily. All you see is everyone gets happy. <laughs> That's what happens <laughs> when you surrender. You know, you notice, wow, this feels wonderful. And if you look around, everyone seems happy. <laughs> you, the joy is reflected right back to you real quickly. You not only feel joyful, but you inspire joy and you draw forth witnesses of joy. And that's what takes you into the happy dream. Okay, now we're ready to see where this uh, scene is going, because this, uh, this is definitely a healing movie. <laughs> there it is. Why do we love that? That is like saying, I'm letting go of repression, and I'm going to let go of denial. Uh, I'm going to let go of denying the power of my mind. Why? Because God created my mind. God, God gave me that power as a gift. And she does leave Arendelle, and she, she goes and climbs all the way up that snowy mountain. But to me, that's just because she's moving into a place where she feels safe to let her powers come out. <laughs> she's going to fling that energy in every direction. Uh, she even talks about feeling one with the sky, one with the sky. She's allowing a feeling of oneness to come back into her mind because she realizes she's been hiding. She's been hiding, hiding, hiding her power. And she's been afraid of her power. And I noticed when she said, uh, 
I'm never going back. The past is in the past. She took the crown <laughs> out of her hair and she flung the crown. She flung the position. She flung the role of queen. She was loosening in that moment from the role. Uh, she also let her hair down. You know, she had her hair all up. And then when she really let it out, the hair came down. So there's a lot of symbolism there. And you can feel the energy of that because all of us have to go to a point where we stop living by the fear and we take a step to feel and, and experience the power of our mind. Now, still, uh, there was definitely a lot of manifesting going on on that mountain. <laughs> she manifested a, a house. She she made a lot of things that there out of ice in a very in like in like a minute and a half. She manifested more than most people in the world will ever manifest. <laughs> she she manifested it very quickly. But the good thing about it is is it's a reverberation and a reflection of the power of the mind. And she did not hold back. She did not have one stroke or one motion where she was hesitating. There was complete extension and the, and the power was flowing. And before that, though, she said, it looks like, uh, she said, it's very isolated and it's basically was saying, looks like now I'm the queen of isolation instead of uh, the queen of Arendelle. So when you have, even when you have a mystical experience, it can be very much like this, where you start to feel the oneness, you feel the connection, you feel the strength, you feel the power of the mind. And then it's helpful to go into prayer and and have the Holy Spirit remind you that that this entire cosmos was made for one purpose. The ego made the cosmos. What's the purpose behind the Big Bang? I'll tell you what the purpose behind the Big Bang is. To make you mindless. Not only to forget the power of the mind, but to forget the mind entirely. Uh, even when we grow up, occasionally when we're growing up as children, we hear the word mind. Unless you grow up in a real scientific house, like your parents are doctors, they'll talk a lot more about the brain. <laughs> they're, they're talking a lot more about the brain and the body. But the ego made this world of time and space with one purpose, to keep you mindless to keep you out of touch with the mind, out of touch with the power. That's why the ego's game is smallness. The ego's game is littleness. The ego's game is scarcity, lack. The, ego, the ego's game is limits, rules, regulations. Uh, the ego is all about littleness. Actually, the ego wants you to believe that you're weak, frail, and guilty. And if you insist on letting in some idea that you're powerful, it will try to convince you with pride that you're a powerful person. That's the flip side of weak person is powerful person. But neither are true. You you never were a weak person or a powerful person. But when you start to regain an essence, a sense of the power of the mind, then you have to face the belief in uh, miscreation. The belief in miscreation is is the whole cosmos. It's not it's not just uh, you know stealing something from someone or or harming somebody it's literally the whole cosmos is a projection of specialness it's a projection of uh of the ego so 
she's at the point here where she's allowed herself to not deny or repress that that feeling of power. But it's actually just the first step on our journey of spiritual awakening. There are many that have had really some pretty strong glimpses, uh, whether they're miraculous experiences or whether they're revelatory experiences or mystical experiences, they all feel very empowering. You, you When you have one, you go, wow, this is amazing. I. I am definitely not what I thought I was after you have an experience like that. But what Jesus is telling us is it's just the beginning because we have to learn to become consistently miracle-minded in order to stay consistently aware of the power, the vastness of the mind. So right now, Elsa is just at that point where she's just like, she's come out of this dark period of years wearing gloves, hiding, concealing, playing small, shutting herself off from her sister, from the, the community because of the fear of the misuse of those uh, those magical powers. And now she's finally let it rip through her. And uh, I don't think anybody who's ever heard that song is now is ever going to forget it. <laughs> that song will be in your mind now. <laughs> Let it go, let it go. You know, it's so strong. The past is in the past. That's like the spirit just booming through into our mind. And uh, I remember when I first saw this movie, I was up in Camas, I think, which is high up in the, in, a, in a mountain plateau. It was a snowy day. We all walked from Camas down to the theater. We walked in. We went into this old theater with these old chairs. And then, boom, that song just hit us all like a, like an avalanche of light. And uh, none of us were ever the same. <laughs> we, we were lit up by that song. So, okay, here we go. Let's see what happens next. <laughs> okay. So, the, the, the love experts are the trolls that are disguised as rocks, and they helped once already, but she doesn't even remember that. They helped her when she was knocked out and unconscious, and now she's come down from uh, the high mountain uh, where her sister's uh, powers came up again. But it's interesting when her sister's powers come up, they both were singing a song, Anna was singing a song of we need to join together and we need to to let let things be made right. Wow, Elsa's song turned into this acknowledgement of what she called the storm within. Ah, that's the unconscious mind. There's a storm underneath our perceptual world. The perceptual world that we perceive with our five senses is, I did a diagram called levels of mind. It's the most outer, most ring on the diagram. And the ring that our five senses perceive, it's really like the gross, we'll call it the gross perceptual world. Underneath that ring, that perceptual ring, is a storm. And the storm is the emotional realm of fear. So uh, a lot of times we grow up hearing love makes the world go round. Actually, it's fear. Uh, fear moves the spheres. Fear moves the cosmos. Fear moves the planets. It's There's a ring of fear that's underneath the perceptual world. And when people meditate, even like Vipassana or major meditators, the deeper they go into the mind, every time one meditates to go really deep, you, you have to touch upon the ring of fear, because the ring of fear is what made the perceptual world. Jesus tells us in A Course in Miracles, he says, you will look upon that which you feel within. And that's what the levels of the mind diagram that Jesus gave me shows, that right outside the ring of emotion is the ring of perception. Now, underneath that ring of emotion is the realm of cognition or thoughts. 
And then underneath the thoughts is the realm of beliefs. So you can believe things about your thoughts because belief is, is actually deeper than, than the thoughts themselves. And then the ego itself is a belief. And then as you go down to the core, it's, it's the prayer or the desire of the heart. And Jesus said, you know, he said, basically, truth will be returned by your desire as it was lost by your desire for something else. So that, that, that desire is the core in, inside that it sets us free. We had a wish to be separate that got placed on that altar, and boom, we seem to see a cosmos. And then when we forgive or accept the atonement, then that that wish is, is disappears, it dissolves, and, and never was. And we return to let thine eye be single. We return to creation, spiritual creation, which is single desire. So the storm that Elsa was talking about, that's the source of the fear. The, the internal storm, we'll call it, of a split mind, of a mind that believes in Holy Spirit and uh, ego. Basically, that split mind is the storm. Uh, because those two uh, never meet. The Holy Spirit never meets with the with the ego. So what happens as soon as she basically says you have to leave, um, and they basically are not wanting to leave, uh, Olaf and and Hans and not Hans the Olaf and the the mountain man and. Anna, they all are basically not wanting to leave, and that's when the anger comes up from the storm and makes a giant snowman. It's interesting, too, that that Elsa has, has manifested Olaf, who is the most sweet, adorable... <laughs> he's, like, he's like a projection of the right mind. <laughs> he's so sweet and, and friendly. Uh, and open-hearted, and then she also projected out of anger and hatred as a protector uh, this gigantic uh, snowman that turns quite fierce when Anna hits him with a snow snowball. <laughs> but you can see that that's what happens when there's a split mind. On the surface of consciousness, we perceive the good guys, the bad guys. We we perceive different witnesses. It's very confusing. You know, when you go through this world and you you have these amazing experiences and these beautiful reflections, and then you see some really dark reflections that make you question what is going on? <laughs> what what a wacky world with with different uh, opposites. It's a world of opposites, a world of multiplicity is very complex. And a world of opposites with everything, it's a it's a projection of insanity. It's a projection of a split mind. So at this point, though, they've come down. They they got back down. He went to his love experts, and these are the same uh, love experts that helped out the king and queen at the beginning of the movie. But the love experts seem to be trying to matchmake. <laughs> and they're really trying to make a match make uh make a and they're calling them fixer uppers and then suddenly though the love and the wisdom comes out in the song where they basically say you really can't change anybody but you can bring the love out that that the the pairing or the assignment can bring true love out of your heart. And there it is. Uh, once again, the, the stones, we're not talking about Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, we're talking about the stones that roll into dwarfs. And these cute little dwarfs have actually revealed in their song that they're not really, you can't really fix somebody up, but you can see the best in them. And you can find the true love in your heart, basically uh, through the use of uh, assigned relationships. So, so basically, they they are matchmaking, <laughs> uh, and 
And that's kind of the way helpers work. True helpers will do matchmaking because, because they know that the purpose of the matchmaking is to find true love, is to remember God. And yet the ego only sees differences. It only sees separation. It always is emphasizing differences and making crazy comparisons. And that's what feels so hard about relationships. Okay, so here we go. We've reached we've reached the Rolling Stones, but we've actually reached a little kind of a, a, a beautiful reflection of you really can't fix somebody up, but you can see the best in them. And the best in them is spirit. And that's why we're brought together. We just we don't always get love love experts like this, but but we hope for that. We pray we pray to have some true love experts come come uh, and show us the way. And we have some pretty good mystics and saints. Uh, we've seen a lot of them. So okay, here we go. We got to see where this goes. It's actually a true love hug between sisters that yeah. pulled it off. Yeah, it. Was, it I love Disney. They could take a different angle. Yeah. Looks like it's coming together, and then no, no, it's, it's sisters' true love hug that thaws it out. Yeah. So I heard from Muna. She said she loved it. How did everyone like it? Wasn't it good? <laughs> that's funny. That's that's the way to wake up. Yeah. Movies like that. It's almost like getting a, a, a wake-up lullaby, wake-up movies, again and again and again. Yeah, just adorable. And Olaf, he was so funny. He just kept showing up, and he was, he was very transparent with his thoughts. You need a true love kiss from the one who left you. Well, maybe, maybe he didn't leave you. <laughs> He's like discovering the love himself through the whole thing. You're melting. Well, sometimes you have to melt for someone. Some, are, some people are worth melting for. Oh my gosh. That sounds like marriage therapy. Some people are worth melting for. <laughs> So did you follow the metaphysics underneath that one? Yeah, that's pretty strong, that whole idea. Because, yeah, when you go into metaphysics, like miscreation, what is miscreation? Doesn't, doesn't sound good. <laughs> the creation part sounds good, but the miscreation, so. Yeah, and starting to see that it's not really there aren't specific miscreations, it's just a, just the whole thing is, is an attempt at the impossible. And so that's really what the, the forgiveness is about, is just being willing. To, there, there was a time I was reading that in the Course, where, I think it was pretty close to the Rules for Decision section, where Jesus used the phrase, where you realize, I'd be better off if I were wrong. <laughs> we're talking about kind of completely wrong, not wrong about any specific action or thought or something like that, but I mean completely. But it seems like that's, it's like in 12 steps, don't they have that where you have to, that's one of the early steps you have to admit Mitch is you're powerless over first step. First step in the twelve step program is to admit you're powerless, which take opens you to what's real and true, which which actually is powerful, but but yeah, that's part of the healing is the admission powerless over alcohol, powerless over addiction, powerless over this crazy fragmented perception of a world. You know, that's like the first step is the admission. And then Jesus describes that in the, in the workbook in Lesson 79 and 80. Lesson 79 is, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. 
solved. And then number 80 is let me recognize my problems have been solved. So that's, you can feel in 79 there's some kind of an admission of, oh, I was mistaken, completely mistaken about what I believed was the problem. And I couldn't really accept 80. I couldn't accept the answer until I could admit I had a perceptual problem. So that's our, it's our Course in Miracles version of 12 step. Step number one. The spiritual principle is honesty. Honesty. Yeah. Course in Miracles gathers, all the students gather around. Hi, my name is, and I have a perceptual problem. Nice to meet you. Next one. Hi, my name is, and I have a perceptual problem. Yeah. So that's, that's like, that's the key. You know, if, if you come away with one thing from this whole retreat, that, that's a huge key. Because it's like when you go into that, there's a, there's a humbleness required and honesty that kind of is the, the turn of the key that unlocks the openness, the allowance, and then the acceptance that comes, that follows the admission. So it's like, first step, admit that I was wrong about everything. Second step, allow myself to be willing for another way, another way to look at the world, and then finally accept, accept another way, accept a higher interpretation than, than the one I tried many times. <laughs> it didn't work. Tried the, we tried the key of pride, and the key never fit in the lock. We couldn't even jiggle the lock with that pride key. We tried it so many times. Peter Cetera and shared it a song. I tried it on my own, but deep inside, we've known we'd be better better off. Better off if we were wrong. Yeah. So anyone have any? We still have the purple mic here for follow-up. I just love that movie. I can't contain myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exactly that realization um, that I, you know, I was wrong. The perceptual problem, believing all these timeline abuse images and feelings. But the key, as always, was just very strong prayer to stay with Jesus, to stay with Holy Spirit, because I tried it on my own. I tried to solve all these worldly problems on my own. And it's only by just riding, you know, on, on the power of Holy Spirit in Jesus that today I get to see it. this is just nonsense. I'm not putting up with nonsense. You know, <laughs> like, why would I? And each time I get to this point, it's always the, the sacrifice of being a human being or a character comes in and I'm like, yes. I'm willing to sacrifice <laughs> if the winning is going to be um, as spirit and not as a body or a human being, which has been my desire for such a long time. I'm willing to do it. And that's what's coming through now. That's the healing for me. It's like <laughs> accepting the sacrifice that the ego called sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that moment when she and her sister hugged um, it was so beautiful. My mind was going to me and my sister because we didn't hug, we did the opposite. But why did they hug? It's like they dissolved the misunderstanding fundamentally. So I love that hug. That was a huge metaphysical hug. And that was profound because love comes 
from resolving the misunderstanding. It's not interpersonal. It's not, it didn't come from Prin Prince Charming or whatever. So that was really profound. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I like how Jesus can reinterpret anything. I, You know, a lot of us have come through our religious traditions and sacrifice was a key idea, but but Jesus is the Master. I, I remember the first time when I was going through the course and text and workbook and then I got to the manual and then they asked Jesus the question, what is the real meaning of sacrifice? I thought, oh, I need to hear this. Let's hear from the Master. Actually, Jesus is a master at reinterpreting anything, so, so he always is able to take it and, and take it and turn it in a different light. He, he never skips over anything. He just doesn't give out and say, there is no sacrifice. But he says, okay, sacrifice, he defines in that little section, what is the real meaning of sacrifice? Jesus says, sacrifice is the giving up of what you want. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and what, O oh teacher of God, do you want? Starts off, it's the giving up of what you want. And what, O oh teacher of God, do you want? You have been called by God to the holiest function that there is. Would you now sacrifice the call? Oh, would you sacrifice the call? Would you sacrifice your intuition? Would you, you're giving up of what you want? You want the fear or you want the call? Because <laughs> the, the range is set. Those are the options. Fear, is to not answer the call or to say no. And then the to answer the call, which is our joy, is is to give up the fear. And I think we're ready for it. I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, like we're we're answering the call. We're here we're answering the, why does fear keeps arising. Yeah, it's like this he has a section in the in the text called the last unanswered question and and he gives the first question, the second question, the third question, and then he says the fourth question is so different from the first three. Because the first three you can answer yes and change your mind. There's wiggle room. But the last, because of the last unanswered question is, the question is, do I want to see what I denied because it is the truth? So he's like making an offer in the final question. And he's saying, if you say yes to this one, they all disappear. There's no return to illusions. That's just the final question. Do I want to see what I denied because it is a truth? And really what he's talking about there is, what does he mean? Do I want to see what I denied? He's talking about Christ's vision. He's talking about seeing with the spirit and not the five senses, not the body's eyes. And Helen Schuckman, who was the scribe of A Course in Miracles, she was over in her office one day at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and one day in her life, she was just in her office and there, and then she went blind. She completely lost her eyesight. Yeah. And so her associates helped her. I, I don't know if a bill or but associates they helped her across the street. She she was in the medical center. Across the street was uh, 
uh, neurology department. So they went across blind to the neurology department and and they ran all kinds of tests on her, all kinds of neurological tests, but they couldn't find anything. She just suddenly couldn't see. So finally, of course, she did, instead of going to the neurology department, she turned within and prayed and asked Jesus, what's going on? And he said that her fear of light, her fear of spiritual vision was projected out onto the body, the body's eyes. So she couldn't, you see, that's how the ego does it. It made the body, it made the world to project the cause into the world with everything. Poverty, disease, fear, doubt, everything. The world is a projection. Like I said yesterday, to project is tr to try to get rid of something that you do not want by seeing it as if it's elsewhere. It's in the mind. It's always in the mind. Everything is in the mind. But So that was kind of a neat little parable though, because then her eyesight came back. That was, that was all just to turn to Jesus and get <laughs> a little bit of wisdom. <laughs> I remember when I was living in Cincinnati too, I, I used to go up, I think it was around Hamilton or Middletown, it's a little, it's a town north of Cincinnati and I would go up there to a chapel and I would go and teach and visit there every once in a while. And one time I went there and this woman that uh, I used to meet up there all the time, she gave a testimony because um, she had the thickest glasses that I'd ever seen. She had these really hunks of glass that she always wore. And when I went up there one time, she was, she was out driving her car one day, and she just said, I just started to look around while I was driving and everything was so clear and bright and brilliant and it was so, she was like, I've never seen the world this way and everything. And then to her amazement, she went like this and she didn't have her glasses on. And she was like, oh! <laughs> she had this, that was a reflection of the miracle that she had just been in such a prayer and had gone and hopped into the car. <laughs> without her glasses, took off driving and had never seen the world in such a spectacular way. And, you know, those are the kind of symbols that we get along the way, little signs and symbols. They can be little synchronicities, like you just are doing something and you're like, wow, that, that was the easiest thing I've ever done. When you anticipated something difficult or a struggle, it turns super easy or somebody that you're just thinking about shows up. I mentioned we have this uh, glass uh, in our kitchen over there and we would have all these long meetings in our, at the time at the kitchen table. And we would all sit there and talk and talk and talk and the monastery had quite a few people. And we would, we would mention somebody and they would walk by the, the glass and we would go. Wow, that was interesting. And then we would go talk, talk, talk. Then we mentioned somebody else, and there they go. It was, it was like Jesus just playing with it. Just whoever we would mention, we would watch. And then <laughs> we were all watching like that scene in the Truman Show when he's in the car with Meryl, and he's watching. Here it comes, guy with a dog, and. Truman, Truman, there's the dented beetle, the little, well, there's the dented beetle. We were like, talk it, say a name, and there they go. <laughs> like right in front of the glass, it's kind of a, like an oval. Yeah, like a big bay window. Like a big bay window. Holodeck. Holodeck. We felt like we were in a holodeck. We were, Jesus was just playing with us with our mind, you know, make, okay, you name, name one, watch and watch. We say something. And there they go. <laughs> but those are just, it's just all cute little signs and symbols 
all designed with only one purpose in mind, to just see that it's all mind, that, that, there are, that nothing's at random, that there are no accidents, and that chance plays no part whatsoever. I mean, right there, that starts to, you start to feel a relief when you realize that chance plays no part, because it, it starts to be, come together in kind of a very integrated way. I know Mary Baker Eddy, she, you know, she's the one who took down science and health with Key to the Scriptures. But it's kind of interesting, she was so deep into the teachings and that the title that they came up for the church was Christian Science. Interesting, put those two words together, Crinch, Christian Science. Scientific, metaphysics are scientific. Awakening is scientific. It's, Kirsten was driving one day and she had to pull over because you got that song, Quantum Love. So she took down this song. Yeah, one of the lines in the song is, It's quantum physics, baby. Love radiates undefined. Yeah, she had to pull over and take down the song, Quantum Love, which has kind of turned a bit, here at the monastery, it kind of turned into an anthem. <laughs> we were at Strawberry, everybody's singing, everybody's swaying, we're singing Quantum Love. And then, of course, the next year we sing it, the next year we still, <laughs> it's uh, turned into an anthem. But it just, you were just driving and then you had to pull over to take it in. But that was, yeah, that's it. That's, it's, it's scientific. Absolutely. It's faith turned scientific. Paul. Thank you. So, uh, it was a great movie. Thank you for uh, playing that tonight. Uh, I liked it a lot better than last night's movie, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but the uh, Hans, um, Interesting character, uh, reminds me of the ego, and uh, tricking her into thinking that uh, he loved her and um, trying to get her to marry her, marry him. And the way it ended, uh, you know, where they were in the scene in front of the fireplace, and I'm gonna leave you to die now. And I just started, I started thinking, yeah, the ego is a death wish, uh, but. I, I just, I, I, you know, I just wondered uh, what your thoughts were around Hans, and it seemed like he had a plan to, to trick her, uh, which he was able to carry out, and he pulled it off pretty well to the end. So yeah, he waited till right before she was ready for her true love kiss, and then his face just shifted, and it was like, oh, yeah, I think that. That, what you just shared, that's, that's very illustrative of how Jesus, one point, uses the adjective to describe the ego as ingenious. So basically, if we put it all together, it's an ingenious puff of nothing. Ultimately, that's why we're not to be afraid of it, because it's a puff of nothing. But, it's the ingenious part that makes you go, hmm, this is a world of tricks, and it's layers upon layers. And sometimes I'll be talking, and I'll be talking about the ego, and I'll just go, sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. That's, to me, what ingenious is. It's sneaky. And Jesus says that the more you the more you look at fear, the less you see of it. The first time I read that, I said, what did he What's that? What's that again? The more you look at fear, the less you see of it. Meaning, the more you expose, it's unconscious. So the more you expose it and see it, the thought system, exactly as it is, the less you see of it and the less you're going to project it. Because there's no need to see it outside anymore. Once you see it, 
in the mind. Kind of like that elevator scene last night. That was probably the best scene in the movie where he's in there and, you know, come Jake, you know, and you could see, and then even a gun, and he's like, ha, ah! <laughs> you know, oh yeah, this one's not going down. This little ingenious puff of nothing is, it, it, it can't go away through destruction or through a fight. You can't fight it. Because that just perpetuates it, it just strengthens it. And Kirsten mentioned that line from, from the Course too, until you look at the full extent of your own self-hatred, you, you will not be free of it. That's an interesting line, the full extent of your own self-hatred. So it's like, well, okay, then tell me, how do I look at the full extent of my own ha self-hatred? Maybe you can give me some clues <laughs> of how to do that. And he just says, well, he has a couple of lines that really help. He says, you are not responsible for the error. Good to know. But you are responsible for the accepting the correction to the error. That is the key. You are not responsible for the error. You're not responsible for the ego. But you are responsible for accepting the correction for the ego, for the error. Okay, that's part one. Then part two, do not project the error to time. Ooh, that's those two bookends. Ooh, that gives us a big clue about forgiveness. Do not project the error to time. Whenever you are tempted to blame somebody or point the finger or get angry at a circumstance, a situation, a brother, a sister, anything, then that's the attempt to project the error to time. And that's how it hides. So it's like, oh, it's quite ingenious. First of all, it wants to believe that we did it and we're guilty. So it's it's not going to tell us that we're not responsible for the error. The ego is going to say, oh, yes, you are. You separated from God. And if you try to go back, God will kill you. God will strike you. The ego is like saying, don't think you can fall from grace and just go back, ali ali income free, oh, come home, no problem, just come. The ego is saying, you will pay a price for that mistake. You will pay for it, and you will pay with death. So that's why there's a, there's a line in the Bible that Christians often say, fear God and keep His commandments. But it really means hold God in awe, in awe of the love. It's just pure love. That's pure innocence. That's awe. Because it, it, there's a presence that is just pure love and innocence. That's all. But it gets flipped by the ego into fear. That you're actually supposed to fear God. And that that is completely opposite. That's the ego, how sneaky it is. It will, it will make its own theology to twist the teachings of Jesus twist them upside down. When they're meant to set the mind free, it's going to try to use the, the teachings to imprison. So, so those two statements together are important. So it just means that that's what we need during our mind training phase. When we're tempted to blame or project in any way, in any way, shape, or form, in any situation, to remember, don't project the error to time. It's more like Jesus is saying, stay with me, okay, allow it, allow the emotion, let it come up, don't push it, don't push it back down, because it's that's how you keep it, by hiding it. Like El we saw with Elsa, you know, hide, conceal, she was using all the words. Uh, and we also could see she was, she was not happy. Neither sister looked happy. Uh, when there was all this hiding and concealing going on. And for Anna, it was it was just a closed door. Like she just got felt completely shut out. So she was trying to loosen up from the split mind. On one hand, 
you know, Hans was saying, don't go, don't go, you know, don't you think your sister will harm you? And she said, no, my sister won't harm me. On the other hand, she just said 10 minutes before that in the movie, you know, right to Elsa's face, you shut me out. <laughs> you, see, you see the split. If you really learn to just listen with your discernment, you can see that the human condition is, yeah, Joe versus the volcano is called a Fliberty Gibbet. Meg Ryan, Meg Ryan plays all the characters. She's like, I'm a Fliberty Gibbet. That's a, yeah, the human mind that's split is a Fliberty Gibbet. I love you, I love you. Get out of my face. My sister would never hurt me. You shut me out. You know, it's boop, 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 boop. It's, it's schizophrenic. It's, it's a split mind. And so the way to bring an end to that is to keep being reminded that you're not responsible for the error and, and stay vigilant. That's the third lesson of, of the Holy Spirit. The third and final lesson is be vigilant for God in His kingdom. So it, it comes down to that vigilance that vigilance as best as you can. And Jesus even says, in this world, even the advanced teacher of God will give way to temptation. He's telling us that this ego is sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. It is, it is just ingenious at, at trickery. And it, it has invented so many defense mechanisms that he's basically saying, even when you advance, you're going to get tricked still. So don't don't get don't get down on yourself even if that happens. He's kind of he made it all the way through so he's giving us a roadmap. <laughs> but really he's giving us a, he's cheering us on, you know, he's cheering us on, he's cheering us on. He says, you know, as you go along, doubt along the way will come and go and come and go again, yet is the ending certain? So he's, he even uses sentences to talk about the Fliberty Gibbet part. He didn't call it a Fliberty Gibbet, that's my word, but, <laughs> you know, he knows that it's going to be a lot of, like a fish that's out of water on the beach that's just flipping, you know, flipping, flipping, flipping around, needing help. And it's important, though, to not take any of that um, to heart, you know to just come back to love, true love will find a way. And, and be lifted up with that, you know, keep the faith. So I remember I, I just would listen to saturate myself with very positive, uplifting songs to, to lift me up. I know a lot of people who, yeah, they have their music meditations and they just use music and, or films like tonight, you know, that, that's a great one. You're feeling down, put on the Disney movie. <laughs> you know? And you, you have to keep your spirit up. You have to do whatever it takes to keep the faith. I had a friend that I visited in, in, uh, on Whidbey Island back around 1991, and her name was Dorothy, and I went out there and she, she invited me out to her mobile home on Woodby Island and when I went in, she had taken post-it notes and put one word on like 45 post-it notes. And it was all over. The post-it notes were, the, they were more than just on the fridge, they were on the sink, they were in the bathroom, they were on the ceiling and everything. And I just went in there and I just, I just left. I said, wow, you're You've got some reminders going here. And the one word was aware. She just wrote aware out on all these post-it notes. <laughs> Stuck it everywhere. And, and you know, she, she was really detached. I remember when she first, I met her in Roscoe, New York, up at Ken and Gloria's place at, Foundation for a Course in Miracles, but she was so detached that she finally said, I'm going back to my trailer in Whidbey Island. She drove all the way across the country from New York, Catskill Mountains, to Whidbey Island, took the ferry, got there, 
and and she had left her uh, mobile home, you know, for some, actually some years while she was at the foundation. And when she got there, she got out of her car, and her neighbor <laughs> came out of the the next door, the next mobile home, and she and her neighbor intercepted her before she could get into her mobile home, and said, "Dorothy, don't go in there, you know, it's it's ransacked. It's 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 just been." totally vandalized and just don't, stay with me tonight. Don't, don't go in there. So she waited and she went and slept with her friend and the next day she went in there and she walked through. I think there was food stuck on the, on the ceiling. Th things were ripped and torn and thrown all over the place and the carpet was all scruffed up and there was urine on all the carpet and everything like this. And she starts to write this out to me in a, in a letter, and then she goes into her bathroom and they've taken, you know, the commode has the, the, the screws that hold it to, to the ground. They've taken the, the four screws off the commode, and she's in there, sitting on the commode, swishing around like a little girl, writing there, oh, I'm, I'm sliding around in my commode here now, and then she writes, ha, 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 ha. And I knew exactly she was so detached from this world. She was so far gone. She was so joyful that she came back to a ransacked house and she went in there and played like a little girl, like totally unaffected by it, totally into non-possession, totally, totally loosened up from the values of this world. And uh, then she continued on writing letters to me. I was reading it. I was reading all these ha, 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 ha. I thought, well, okay. So she told me the next day, she thought, oh, I need somebody to help me fix this up and clean it up. And But she didn't know what to do, you know, how to get a hold of somebody. So her mother had dropped off uh, a paper or something, but her mother, while she was gone, had thought that she needed help with her yard, because the yard was growing too, obviously, when she was gone. So her mother put an ad in the local classifieds paper for somebody to help, help and come to, this is the address, to help her. But her mother was trying to put, help her with weeding. But she misspelled weeding, weeding to wedding. This is the next day after the sliding around on there. She's like, and so she wakes up the next day in this house, this mobile home, and there's a knock at the door, and then she's got to tell me all about it. Holy Spirit sends this guy and he goes, yeah, I read that you do weddings. That's how she got the guy that would help her clean the place up. Her mother put misspelled weedings. She had stories like this all the time. She she got given a house one time. She got she got given a car. I mean, she had so many parables of these out of pattern experiences because she was just kind of gone, 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 gone from it. And apparently, yeah, that was many years ago in 1991. But I think it was like maybe about two or two and a half years ago. Um, I got a message, I think an email or something, please call me, Dorothy, and it had her phone number. And I hadn't been in contact with her for many years. So I called her up and she, she left because she started to go like my grandmother into almost like dementia. And she forgot so many things. She was going unlearning the world really rapidly and going into this, I call it spiritual dementia, where you get so happy because you can't keep track of time anymore, like my grandmother. And she had come across in a library, she saw, she pulled a book out in the library off and she saw that the book was written by, it had A Course in Miracles in the title and it was written by David Hofmeister. And she just went, that name sounds a little familiar. 
So she had a nursing assistant, because they have, uh, you know, helpers that come from the government, you know, it's an, uh, an assistant that was working, because she was now really up. I met her when she was 58, but she's now, she was up in years. And so she said to her nursing assistant, this name, this author of this book that I found in the library here on Whidbey Island, is, it sounds familiar, so would you research it? Would you uh, check this guy out on the internet? And the woman did and said, here, and, and I, I got his phone number and his email address. So she emailed me. I called her back. She had been in what the world would call a major automobile accident. And I mean, I don't know what all got ripped up, torn off, broken off. Uh, it was like a major, major, major thing. And she would tell me all about it, and she would burst into laughter. She would tell me, she'd say, oh, well, the one toe turned completely black, and, and she burst into laughter. And then she'd tell me, she was describing her body at this point in her life, and just like when she was writing about with the, the ransacked thing, this was years later, she would burst into laughter and she would just laugh and laugh and laugh and go on and tell me more about this. And she would said, yeah, sometimes the, the assistants aren't here and I, I feel like I, I was going to go out and I fell and I and then I got up and I was able to kind of barely get out with a cane, but I got over, tried to get over by this tree and I fell and I was crawling across my yard, bursting into laughter as she's telling me about crawling on her yard, like a little kid just out there in the mud. Uh, and I was just like, oh, thank you, God. She's, she's just a demonstration that that yeah, it's not what happens to us in, in the body. It's always our perception. She could laugh. She could laugh at anything. I think, I think you know, when the time comes for her to lay the body aside, I can just see her. Her last words will probably be her laughing. She'll probably laugh. Go, oh God, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And the ego is like, Ugh. the death wish is, damn, joyful. <laughs> it's almost spit in the face of death. <laughs> spit in the face of disconfigured body or losing memory. She was. She'll tell me the whole story of how she found. Me. A vague remembrance, you know, and I just, I just had tears of happiness just when she called me and everything. So, but that's it, you know. It's that's those are the reminders to us that it's always a choice. That our state of mind is always a choice. And somebody, I think it was a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. Uh, I saw it on Facebook, they were posting that they met this man down in the Lake Chapala area where, where we have our community. And I think this man had been operated on and then he, they, they removed one of his legs. And um, before the operation and after the operation, he sometimes would make some like jewelry or sell some things just to bring in a little bit of money. But the woman was saying, I met him before the operation and I met him after the operation, and all he can talk about every single time she met him is the grace and glory of God. It was like not a single thing about the, what the leg or what he went through or the removal of the leg, not a mention. She said, I would see him out there selling his jewelry and it's like, he was just with the same smile, the same grace, the same glory to God, not a mention of anything. You know, it, that's faith. That's faith. That, 
you know, that's really kind of almost like an experiential experience of that all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. So every complaint that we utter, it's the ego uttering it. Every time we try to put ourselves or somebody down or God down or whatever, it's just, it's just the ego ranting. It's just this insidious, ingenious puff of nothing that trying to make something of nothing, you know, trying to declare something, proclaim something that absolutely is not true, that has no basis in reality whatsoever. And it starts to take you when you start to have these experiences and start to meet people like this, then you start to go, huh, wow, that's inspiring. That's actually inspiring. So, so yeah, we're, I'm grateful for every encounter like that and every song I hear and I was kind of surprised. My ray of light, Madonna. Oh yeah, that's right, that's Frozen too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, just when we were talking about fear, um, I, I was reading that um, Jesus says he, we can't, he won't, he, don't ask him to take the fear, because um, we, um, we have to take responsibility for that. Um, so it's like, I was, I went to, I was looking at the levels of mind, and there's a kind of undefined fear comes up, and I'm thinking, well, I can't give this to Jesus because it's just like, I can't explain it. Yeah. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but I was just like, what? And then I don't even know what it's about. So it's just like, what, if you can't give that to Jesus, what do you, what do you kind of do? I know it's like the responsibility to maybe look underneath. Yeah, I think, I think when that was written, the context was that the, Helen was scribing the course and kind of talking to her friend, a young Ken Wapnick, and, and uh, Ken was going off to, uh, to a convent in the mountains to visit these nuns, and she was so concerned about his safety, and then the message kind of came through was basically from Jesus, I can't take your fear away, but I can help you look at the conditions in your mind, which you have set up and you have selected. That's, that's like, the, don't give somebody a fish, teach them how to fish. You know, yeah. it's good stuff. So, so, what Jesus does, that's what he's doing with the mind training of A Course in Miracles. He's like really, he's instructing us in the conditions the beliefs and the thoughts that we have set up to generate fear. It's, it's like it's, it's generated, it's not real. But he's like, he's going to show us that we need to open to the correction. We need to, by opening to miracles, you know, that's why it's called A Course in Miracles, and he said, be a miracle worker and be a teacher of God. So, so basically he's just, He's kind of like, I think A Course in Miracles is like a roadmap of the mind. That's kind of what I, I think I'd been praying for without even knowing what I was praying for, because I'd been in psychology a bit, but mm -hmm. I wasn't finding any kind of deep answers in the field of psychology. Mm -hmm. I was learning a little bit about the mind and defense mechanisms and things, but I wasn't finding any escape hatch. It was like a minefield. You know? mm -hmm. So. That's really great too, because that's when you think about it, that's much of what I think the Holy Spirit and Jesus are. They're, they're instructors. They're instructing us, and they do need a willing learner. You know, if we're not willing, they'll just wait. You know, they won't even deliver the instructions mm. if we're just going to push it away. 
But when we're ready, then, the, then it seems like this journey that we're on is really just a navigating with lots of instructions, which is our instructions on guidance. We start to learn we can be guided, we start to enjoy being guided, we start to have great experiences being guided, and that draws us more into more guidance. Because it works. Because it's working. It's it's lifting us. That's what we want. We want to be lifted up. So, so, yeah. It's it's the ego would definitely take something like Jesus not taking your fear away and go, ah, look, you're stuck. <laughs> That's what I thought. If Jesus can't, if Jesus won't take your fear away, now you're really stuck. I got gotcha. you. Got gotcha you right where I want you. You offer the fear to Jesus. I can't take your fear away. Aha, gotcha. But it's actually, you have to really see what it means. Like, mm. he's, he's like saying, no, no, I will show you, I will instruct you how this, how you're doing this to yourself, basically. <laughs> he's gonna, I'm going to give you an instruction manual how you're doing this to yourself. And it's a really good instruction manual. You know, I used to read it for eight hours a day, just popping it open and using it as an oracle. And... Uh, when I couldn't really hear Jesus' voice, I thought, next best thing, I've got his book, and pray, and what a great oracle. Then I would read on for sometimes quite a while. Get the answer, this is good stuff. <laughs> then I'd be lost in reading, 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 and finally, yeah. till the ego would just pull the eyelids down, stop, stop. <laughs> No more! Put the book down! And I would kind of gear up for a fight with the ego, and Jesus would say, No, put the book down. And he'd say, Let's go for a walk, or let's go have a snack. Why not have a swim? Let's go play some tennis. That's how Jesus handles resistance. He would come right back in, Let's do something fun. Take a siesta, take a nap, go, take a walk, have a snack, a swim, take a siesta, I'm fresh. Okay, here's my prayer. Psh, gone for another two hours. Till that you go, no, 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 my pretty. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you know, it, it works though, so you know you're 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 coming back <laughs> like you yeah. you say I'm new in this, but this is good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I was reading it for hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, isn't it great? You get a yeah. book that you don't want to put down. Yeah, that's this deep. <laughs> yeah, and it never ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like it's mm -hmm. very deep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's good. We, it helps to hear our experiences to share with each other, yeah. That helps too. Yeah, I was just doing the Course, just reading it and praying and studying and everything, but then at one point Jesus just took me, I think in this span of just one week, He took me to like five Course in Miracles groups. So I went from a very solitary kind of individual thing and like those cars where they go zero to fifty in so many point seconds. It was like zero course groups to five in in a week. I was like, because I was shy, so that was a pretty big deal. Yeah, I wasn't a social butterfly, a social person. Yes. Do you have any memories that you can share with us uh, of experiences that you had with Ken and Judy and Helen that you live with them or, I don't know, anything uh, that you can Helen share? Helen had passed away before I got yeah. into the course. Yeah, but you were with Judy and with Ken, right? Mm -hmm. Ken and Gloria, yeah, starting around 1990. That's where I met my friend Dorothy at the Foundation for A Course in Miracles in the Catskill Mountains. 
yeah, I had um, I had just a lot of encounters up there. Even even the way I I would seem to get there seemed very miraculous. And I, when I got there, um, the first time I went up there, I got there. It was so miraculous. It felt like time and space were collapsed. So I actually arrived so fast in this little garage sale, yard sale car that the Spirit got for me that, that I think I was like a day, at least a day, a day and a half early. So I walked in to the workshop, the previous workshop. I just walked in at nighttime and I was in the lobby and I heard Ken's voice and I just like walked in and walked right into the workshop and he just paused and went, oh, welcome. I I just got there so early, I walked in on the previous group. But then, yeah, he he was so generous, he he just, as it took a pause after that, or a break in the middle of that evening session, he said, oh, come with me, everything's closed up. I said, yeah, I don't know, I just got my car and somehow I got here too early. And he said, so he went around and opened up the office and got me a key and took me to a room and and got me in there. And then, um, yeah, I would talk to a lot of the people. There was actually a, a pastor from Texas who had studied the Course very deeply. His name was Kurt Morrow. And he had been like a his dad, I think, was a Baptist preacher, and he went from like being a Baptist in Texas to diving into the Course and having all these experiences. And then he had, he was also gay, imagine a Baptist, <laughs> gay, Course in Miracles, and he passed away with AIDS. So his whole Course group had come, I mean, they had the funeral, and half the people at the funeral were Baptists and half the people were Course in Miracles. So that was kind of an interesting Texas, Texas funeral. And then the whole group, uh, his stu Course students, had come to be with Ken. It was maybe like 35 or 40 people from, from this little town in Texas. So I walk in, Ken helps me after the, the break to get, to get a room and get he gets me situated, whatever I need. He said, let me help you. It's dark. He's going around, opening things up, getting things for me. And then when I go and I meet the people, they're like, hi, how you doing? I was like hugged by 35 or 40 people from Texas. Well, what are you doing here? By golly, we're so glad you're here. Well, this is, this, this is how I got welcomed in, getting a day and have early and just, I was helped by Ken, hugged, 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 and all their southern drawl and all this southern hospitality. They weren't even in their own home state, they were with Ken. It was just welcoming. And then when I did start to travel, I did go through, yeah, Texas, Oklahoma. I went through Route 40 down, down to the south. They, these people welcomed me into homes, um, you know, they, they were part of my first trip. Uh, they just loved me and welcomed me, which is great, your first trip out, to feel so much love and welcome. Like, Jesus has really got your back. So, yeah, I had I had quite a, I mean, I, I think I went there, th I think, three or four times. And s sometimes I would spend a, a little more, have more of a lengthy stay than others. So, yeah. And I did, I spent a lot of time in the sunroom in the library, listening to a lot of sessions, watching Krishnamurti videos and all kinds of stuff. In the middle of the night I couldn't sleep, I had so much energy. And then every time I'd go up there, people would like come out of the woodwork and say, can take me to, I'll take you to dinner, I have to, I have to talk to you, I have to talk to you. So I had a bunch of holy encounters there. And then with Judy, yeah, I, I think the first time I contacted Judy Scutch, she was, she just said, well, come on out, come, if you want to come for a visit. So 
she met me at a restaurant. I remember she had a white Honda and some kind of license plate that was a, one of these messages on the back of it. And then we went in there and she gave me a gift right away. It was a book of peacemakers in the world throughout, you know, the centuries, Mandela and Gandhi and everything. She said, here, I have a gift for you. Always a great hostess, always. And then I just, yeah, that was the first time. So when I would go back, which I did many times with bringing friends, bringing people, bringing, she would have dinner, hosting us, and then her husband, Whit, William Whitson, and her daughter, Tam, and so, yeah, we're still really good friends. And actually, while Judy was still alive, we had a, I've called a fundraiser instead of a fundraiser, a fundraiser to raise money for the Foundation for Inner Peace. And the Tam, her daughter, and her, and Bob Resenthal from the Foundation came. They came here and we had, we invited Gary Renard, John Monday, bunch of people, and then we beamed in Judy. Uh, so she beamed in and talked to all of us. I forget where was that in the campground? Yeah, the campground. Down in the campground. On a big screen. On a big screen we we beamed in Judy. Yeah, she talked to all of us. So so yeah, we have a lot of fond memories of yeah, of the encounters. And uh, I think it's important to like all of you coming here, it's important to meet people who are on this path. You know, look at it. You, you come here for 12 days and the ego is like not happy at all. It's like, oh, hell. <laughs> now you're going out and meeting mighty companions now? It's like, oh, because it knows its days are numbered. <laughs> it's the hourglass of its tyranny, of its uh, attempted imprisonment, are, its number is up, you know. And then when you start meeting people and talking and, ref and getting witnesses and reflections, you know, your faith grows, your confidence grows, you know, you start to feel, oh yeah, I'm in the tractor beam now, I'm, you got me, <laughs> I'm coming home. And, and that's so important because yeah. before that, you know, it can seem, this world is kind of dicey, you know, it's, it's choppy, it's dicey and you know, you think you're making some steps and then you feel like you get thrown back and, you know, it's a pretty, it's like a riding a wild bronco at times. You're out there, you're trying to just stay on the bronco and then you get tossed 10 feet in the air and then you feel like, oh man. But yeah, it helped me visiting these people. Yeah. And Tara Singh too, I visited him and yeah, lots of the early course, the Varleys, Robert, Robert Varley. Yeah, we just met so many beautiful, beautiful yeah. people along the way. Very yes. cherished. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's past 10. I think it's past our bedtime. <laughs> Kirsten's ready for the full mic to wrap it up. I wasn't here, and then I appeared, and now... <laughs> <laughs>